Well, hey, Mercy Road Church Anderson, can we make some noise for Jesus one time in the building? Yeah. Well, hey, thank you guys for being here with us. Can you help me celebrate those who are attending online as well, watching all over the world, especially those who are on spring break, right? <laughs> Hope, oh, y'all on spring break? Let's make some noise for the spring break people. Okay. Okay. Got my, 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 my crew over here. Well, hey, my name is Mark. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet, I'm the lead pastor here at Mercy Road Church Anderson. And we exist to see people far from God disciple into a passionate relationship with Jesus. And uh, one of the things that we say around here, if, you, if this is your first time, is that we are a hospital for sinners and not a museum for saints. And so if you're the type of person who feel like you've got it all together, you're perfect, you're the perfect Christian, you might be uncomfortable around here because we know that we don't have it all together, but we do serve a God who has everything together. Amen? Come on, let's make some noise for that. Um, and hey, we, we are in week two of an incredible series called Before You Go. Um, and what we're doing is we're exploring the seven last sayings of Jesus uh, while he was on the cross as we are in uh, the, the Lenten season. And, and, and here's the thing. Uh, I was just thinking about this. Before you go, uh, my, my, every time I, I leave the house, it's kind of a running joke. It's almost sad at this point. But almost every time we're getting ready to go somewhere, I get into the car and then I get out because I forgot something. I got to go back. I forget my wallet. I forget my, anybody else like that? Like you all. And look, I saw this thing. I don't know if it was on Amazon or where I was looking, but they had like a placemat that you put in front of the door and it said, do you have your keys, your wallet, the this and that. And I was like, I might need to get that. I didn't tell Whitney because she would have bought it for me already. Anyway, um, but no, before you go, and basically this series is about the things, the seven last things are not like seven last words. These aren't like seven words that Jesus said, but these are actually uh, like kind of seven men they said Jesus wanted everybody to really know, and if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, that these seven last sayings, and we're not going to hit all seven, so I encourage you to go and read the seven for yourself, but the ones that we'll cover, um, you know, they're actually mandates for us. And so last week we kicked it off, Pastor Zach kicked it off, he did a wonderful job, let's make some noise for Pastor Zach. Yeah, he kicked it off, and uh, last week we talked about a word of forgiveness, and the first word that, that Jesus actually uttered on the cross is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And some of you have heard that before, and maybe you didn't know that this was what Jesus was saying while he was on the cross, while he was actually in the process of dying through, from asphyxiation. That's the way that Jesus actually physically, biologically died, asphyxiation. And, and what took place was when, when he, he, he could like barely breathe. So every time he sang a saying, he literally had to lift himself up on, these, on the nails that were in his hand and his feet just to get a breath in order to, you know, expel these words. But what he was saying, forgive them, he was talking about the individuals who were at the foot of the cross, the people that were in the crowd, the people who were in the courts, the same exact people who just a week prior were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, long live the king, were now saying, crucify him, crucify him, kill him. And Jesus is on the cross saying, you know what, God still forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And when I listened to that, I was like, man, this is a mandate for every person who's a believer for us to also forgive. And it's not a mandate for you to forgive people who you like, people who you're close to, people who you want to just make friends with and play in the sand nicely with. No, you have to be willing to forgive the people who still hate you. And it was going to get quiet. You still have to forgive the person that's backstabbing you, that's stabbing you in the back, the person who you know is intentionally doing things to hurt you. Jesus is saying, listen, I know what they're doing, but I'm still going to ask my father to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand who they're messing with. They don't know that I'm a child of God and that it doesn't matter what you do to me. I have a God that, that believes that they can forgive them for anything that they do to me. As a matter of fact, I was listening to a story, uh, it was about two weeks ago, and it was a lady sharing about um, this, this whole idea of, of uh, she, she was sitting down talking to these, these two foreign people, and in this, this village uh, in, in Asia, she was sitting in this village, and, and it, was a, it was a lady who was telling her about this massacre that took place. They killed like 3,000 of their family members, and uh, her family was one of the people who they killed, and it was this gang that was trying to overthrow like the government. This just happened not too long ago. And, and what happened was she was telling them about this gang and she was telling them about they came in and they killed her whole entire family, her husband, 
the, the father to her kids. They killed her kids in front of her and all of this. And, and as she was saying this, they were sitting in this group, and it was her, and it was a gentleman next to her, and it was another gentleman. And as she's telling them this story, she says, and, and God put it on my heart that even though all these people were killed, Jesus came into our village that day. In a way that even though those people who had came in and massacred people who we love, the person who I'm sitting next to is the person who killed my husband and my children, and I forgive them. That's the kind of forgiveness that Jesus is displaying in this word of forgiveness. That it will take some courage. It will take some hard conversations. It might take you to do something that you don't even believe you have the strength to do. The first thing that Jesus lays out for us is that if you call yourself a believer and a follower of Jesus, you have to practice forgiveness. So that was the first word, the first mandate. But that's not the only one. And, and, and today I actually want to talk about the second word, which is a word of salvation. And the word of salvation is interesting because it's kind of interesting that, that after you get a word of forgiveness, Jesus comes in with salvation. Which is interesting because usually if you forgive a person, you probably need some time before you want to give them anything. Right? But Jesus is like, no, no, I'm going to forgive them and give them a gift. I mean, that, that's like beyond, right? Like it's like, all right, I can forgive you. I probably won't forget it. But then to get you a gift, I mean, that's, that's, that's next level. Right? And I'm still on level one. I don't know about you. I'm still on level one. All right? But, but Jesus is now getting us to see that there's, there's something else to this. That before you go, before he left this planet, before he, before he died on that cross, he wanted every person who would believe in him and follow him to know that you want to have to forgive and that there's also a word of salvation. And that word today and what I want to talk about is that Jesus had gifts for a convict. Because I don't know if you know this, but we talk about Jesus being on the cross. Some of you may or may not know that he wasn't the only human being on a cross that day. That on that cross and the way that Jesus died was actually a common practice. It was a common practice for criminals to be taken. They would be beat. They would be whipped. They would be put on a tree and they would be hung. They would be put on a piece of wood, and they would be displayed, and they would be hung up. And, and some of them would be even hung upside down. I mean, but you would see this type of capital punishment taking place. And in the day of Jesus, that, that after he went from judgment hall to judgment hall, they whipped them, and they beat them, and all of them said that, yeah, you're guilty, even though they didn't have any evidence, they still persecuted him. And while on that cross, he wasn't the only one there, but there were other criminals that were around. While all these other criminals were around witnessing not only their own demise, but they were also in the midst of a God. Some of them either knew it and others didn't. But this is where we pick up the crucifixion story. Luke chapter 23 it says, The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, He saved others. Let him save himself, and if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers also came up, and they, they mocked him, and they, they offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was written a notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. It was meant to be sarcastic. And so one of the criminals who hung there, he hurled insults at him. Like, aren't you the Messiah? Why don't you save yourself and get us out of this, this trouble too? Right, like, 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 let's get us out of this cross. They say, this is who you're supposed to be. Like, get us free. But the other criminal, he rebuked him, talking to the other criminal. Like, dude, don't you fear God? He says, since, since you are under the same sentence as me, like, we, we are punished justly. Like we're getting what we deserve, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. When you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response was this. He said, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. 
This is a fascinating passage of scripture where Jesus has just offered forgiveness to the people who who are killing him, who have persecuted him. They're now mocking him. They put a crown of thorns on his head to say, if you're supposed to be the king, they put this note, this is the king of the Jews. He's supposed to be the Messiah. I heard that you healed people. We heard that you healed leprosy. We heard that you, you gave sight to the blind. You made a crippled man walk. Oh, yeah, save yourself now, Jesus. We heard that you were the one. And they're, making a, they're making a mockery of him. And I realized that that in this crowd, there are people who, who, who've even seen these miracles and they're, they're probably even doubting. But I love this passage because what it shows us is that, that there's so many times in our lives that we get so caught up with the noise and the commentary and the insights of all the other people, whether it be the news or whether, whether it be politics or whether it be the hot topic or the trending thing, right? A lot of times we get caught up in the commentary of everybody else and we miss the reality that we're in the midst of a holy God. And I want you to know that that's actually the same tactic, the same trick of the enemy today, that he wants to keep your life distracted. He wants to keep your life stressful. He wants to keep your life feel like you're in shackles, that you can't even see God. You can't hear God. You don't know if God is coming to your doorstep. You don't know if God has even healed you because you have a challenge being able to see the gift that's right in your midst. The first thing that this passage teaches us is that if you want the word of salvation to come into your life, you first have to recognize the gift. And this is what I love about this passage because amidst all of the things that are taking place and transpiring, there's one criminal who knows that in the midst of all of the things that have happened, I did the crime. I'm trying to do the time. They're going to kill me. My days are over with. As a matter of fact, he could probably just take his last breath and he could die because that's what he knows his fate is. And yet, in the process of dying, in the process of getting what he deserves— He's able to recognize the gift that's in his midst. How many of us have been walking through life not realizing that God has been right there all along? That God has been right there all along, but I know, I know what's happened. See, see what's happened here is that, is that one, you need to recognize that I'm not talking about the gifts for the convict that's in the story because the true convict is not the criminal on the cross. The real convict is you and me. That the real people who are guilty of the sin is us. And we're not perfect. And so this voice from the cross is really giving us insight, not into something that happened 2,024 years ago. This has given us insight into something that's happening every day, every second, every hour, where we think that we are not the person who God died for. I want you to know that your life can never be jacked up enough for the gift of God to not reach you where you are. But you've got to recognize the gift. You've got to recognize the gift when it comes into your presence. And I know what happens. What happens is we start to judge the gift by the wrapping paper. See, see, many of us have been conditioned and programmed in the Western church to think that God only shows up in this nice pretty package the way that we want God to show up. That we think God only shows up in the form of a promotion. God shows up when he heals us. God shows up when he helps me work through the divorce. God shows up. No, no, no. Sometimes God shows up as the divorce. Sometimes God shows up in the pain. Sometimes God shows up with the mud. Sometimes God has to show up in the trauma. That's the reason why you got diagnosed with cancer, so that God can show you that he's the gift and he's a healer. See, because the enemy wants you to think that the enemy has the power. No, the enemy has to get permission from our almighty God to do anything and to allow anything to come in your life. But if it shows up, God has a way of putting a stamp on it and shipping it out of your life. Do I have about 15 of you who can testify that things have come in your life, but they didn't stay in your life because our God showed up? 
He doesn't always show up in the same gift wrap that we would like him to show up. God, show up. And see, problem is we think God is like a genie in a bottle. God has to show up in the way that we prescribe God to show up. No, our God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-omniscient. He doesn't need permission from you to show up the way that God needs to show up. He's showing up so that your life can get better. But sometimes it's going to come through your life getting worse first. So it's interesting because I can remember receiving a gift and judging it by the way that it was wrapped. And sometimes we judge it not only because of the way that it's wrapped, but also the person who the gift comes from. I can remember when I first started in ministry and I was preaching, it was actually around Easter as I was thinking about this message, because in the tradition that I grew up in, we used to all get together in these churches and we would go through these seven last sayings like year after year after year. And one year I was actually speaking at a church and, and there was this one lady who would all, always kind of be like, uh, you know how you have those certain people at, at your church or maybe in your life that no matter what positive is happening, they always have something negative to say? Oh, y'all, y'all know her too? <laughs> but it's this person, you know, this, this one time, they, they like handed me like a, 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 a envelope, like an like a envelope to say, oh, I think this is, it was like an Easter card, right? I'm like, okay, and I had a couple of them, so I didn't think nothing of it. And because she's like the negative Nancy, I just was like, okay, thank you. And I never opened it. I didn't even look at it because I, I already conditioned myself to believe that when I opened it, it probably told me my sermon was terrible. Uh, I'll, I'll open it next year, you know. Literally, I lost track of the card, found it about seven months later. I opened up the card, and to my surprise, it had a really nice note about how the message impacted her. And, and along with the note, check this out, it had like a $500 check in it. Oh, I was hurt. I was hurt. I was struggling seminary student and you know like the check has like a deadline it's like 90 days before it's like expired so I'm like oh my god I can't even cash the check <laughs> and then I'm like I start to get hyperventilating I'm like ma look what so-and-so got she's like what the mean one gave you this I'm like I know and so I'm like so what should I do she said well you might want to call her and thank her I'm like damn and then it's probably gonna get negative again <laughs> and so I'm saying that to tell you, sometimes God wants to show up in the people who we despise the most. That sometimes the, the, very, the very boss or that person on your job that just irritates you. Or maybe it's that one teenager kid that you had that's just like, oh. Come on, man. Come on. oh, I hear some parents today. <laughs> don't worry, they're on spring break. They're on spring break. All right. But the gift wrap and the packaging, it impacts the way that we see it. And that's what happens in the cross, that, that everybody else can only see Jesus the way that he's presented. Because remember, he's presented as a criminal. He's now presented and they think that they got him. And he looks just like him. I'm talking about he's whipped, he's beaten, he's bloody. He's hurting. He looks just like all of the other criminals that are hanging on crosses all around him on this hill called Golgotha. Some of it called Skull Hill. But see, they all, they all went down this journey to get to this hill to be crucified and mocked. And this one thief reminds us, no, I can see the gift. Do you not fear God? We're getting what we deserve, but this man is innocent. This man is innocent, and he's done nothing wrong. But see, it's not just good enough for you to recognize the gift. Because once you recognize that the gift is, is there, you have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to repent. Repent. Repent is, is, is a word. You, 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 there's something that has to take place. Repent is not something that happens on the outside. It happens on the inside. There's an internal shift. The word metanoia is, is a word that you also kind of, it's a Greek word, but we get metamorphosis. But metanoia is when you have a shift and a change of mind. It's a Greek word. And, and Paul would use this when he told, told the, those, the, those, uh, those individuals, uh, what was that, in Corinthians. He says, no, no, it was the Romans. He was telling them, he said, look, listen, be ye transformed. 
by the renewing of your mind, the transformation. That word in the Greek was metanoia. And so when you repent, your mind has to change. Your perspective has to change. Your eyes have to change. Your views have to change. And so when you repent, something has to switch. Look at the person next to you and say, turn on the switch. And see, that's the problem with so many Christians. We, 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 we want to recognize the gift, but we don't have a shift. We accepted God, but we, we kept doing the same thing. We accepted God, but there was no internal shift. And that internal shift has to make it. This is what he says. He said to him, he said, don't you fear God? Don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sentence, we, we are punished justly for we are getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Wait a minute. Why? How in the world did he know he was on a cross next to a God? And I said, wow. He had to have figured this out because of what Jesus had already done. What had he done, Mark? He, well, you forget, the first word was a word of forgiveness. He just watched a man who just went through judgment hall after judgment hall after judgment hall. He watched him get beaten, get mocked. He watched him try to serve him some wine vinegar, and they kept spitting on him and throwing rocks at him. And then after all of that, he's on a cross, and the first thing that he utters out of his mouth is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The thief had to be saying to himself, he has to be a God, because there's no way a human would ever have the unmitigated goal to be able to forgive people who once praised them and now they can't wait to see him dead. He said, I have to be next to a God. There was a mental, internal shift that had to take place. And what I love about it is that forgiveness is the linchpin of the gospel. So Jesus literally saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is the epitome of the gospel message that each and every one of us can identify with, that we know that we did it. We know that we've sinned. We know that we are not perfect, but we have to go and submit before all perfect, almighty God. And because of Jesus' sacrifice, we have an opportunity <laughs> to shift and change our minds be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind <laughs> and when I think about shifts and repentance sometimes it takes for you to take distractions away for you to be willing to make the shift for God to actually bring forth new information so that you can actually see the shift so that your eyes can begin to see different for me, Whitney and I, we decided to, uh, for Lent, we were going to give up uh, entertainment, TV. Listen, we're going we're to give up TV. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool. Let's go ahead and do, let's do, let's give up TV. And then, like, literally, like, uh, about three hours later, I'm thinking, what did I just say? <laughs> See, for Whitney, giving up TV in Lent season is, like, cool because all of the stuff that she likes to watch is on Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, right? She can just go back to it. It's March Madness. Why in the world? Why would I? God, I need a shift. But I, I learned something in the process. One, my team's been losing, so that's good. I ain't get a chance to see it. But here's what happened. Not, not watching TV, I started doing other stuff at the house. I'm cleaning and vacuuming, honey do list, all the women clapping. Ah, <laughs> fellas, I'm telling you, don't do it. <laughs> but this, this, this is what happened. All of a sudden, I'm starting to hear from God. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to see how God sees me. I was in a process of, of, of we, we got a cooktop, and, and, you know, cooktops are a little difficult to clean. It's got the glass, and you get a little stuff on it, and then you got the lines, and it smears, and all this stuff. And so, and so you know, it looked like it was clean, but I'm noticing, now I'm noticing stuff, right, because I can't watch basketball. So I'm like, I'm noticing stuff. It's a little spot there. <laughs> so I get the little scraper, and I, I start scraping away, and I get it up. And while I'm scraping, God is saying, this is what I got to do to you. 
see, see you, 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 you preaching now, you got, you, you got church and everything looks good, but there's still, ah, there's still something that I can carve away. There's still something that God is, is smearing out. And sometimes we've got residue that God still wants to work out in our lives. But sometimes we can't see the shift. We can't see what God is doing because we're distracted by the things of culture in the world. And I notice that after you recognize the gift and if you decide to go ahead and repent and make an internal shift, the only thing left to do is to receive the gift. And I, I learned sometimes for some people, it's actually difficult to receive a gift. Some, some people, that's their love language. Like, give them a gift, they love you for three years. Like, they, you don't got to give them nothing. They're like, I got a gift. It's great. But then there are other people who are wired. Like, gifts do nothing for them. In fact, they actually get uncomfortable when they get a gift. Any of those people? I see two of you. Okay. They're the weird folks. Anyway, um, just messing. So, but receiving the gift is, is the other side of what happens to the thief on the cross because he recognizes who Jesus is. He's the God. He's the God of my salvation. And he asks him something. He says, please, when you get into your kingdom, remember me. He, and, and, and let, me let me help you. He says, okay, I recognize and I fear God. He tells the other thief, you crazy. This is God on a cross. And, and he's got something for us. But in the process of that, I, I want you to know, wherever you're going, just remember me. He didn't ask him to give him access to it. He, he, he didn't ask him, hey, can you bring me with you? He just said, I want you to remember me, but let me help you a little bit with that. See, I want you to pull that apart. Because what he was really saying is, I want you to reinstate my membership. Okay. Who am I talking to in here? In other words, remember me because all of us have been created by God. All of us are loved by God. You are a son. You are a daughter. And if you're here today and you're far from God, I want you to know that God wants to remember you. He wants to bring you back into membership of the holy family. He wants to bring you back into covenant with the almighty creator. He wants to remembership you. The other man on the cross was preaching a gospel that I had never heard because he was identifying the idea that I'm next to God who's actually not only my savior, but he was also a part of my creation. And that means if he was part of my creation, then I came from him. So all he's asking is for God to put me back in right relationship with him. And if I'm in right relationship with him, it doesn't matter where I end up because the psalm writer tells us that if I make my bed in hell, then God will be there with me. If I make my bed in heaven, God will be there with me. I wonder, is there anybody in here that's been through hell, but God was walking with you? You've been through a storm, but God was keeping you. You've been through some hard times, but God was blessing you because our God will never leave you nor forsake you. But he had to receive the gift. Remember me. And Jesus' response is simple. Today you will be with me in paradise because today I'm going to die. And when I get to where I'm going, I want you to be right there with me. And this messes up so many theologians because they're like, wait, in the hold on, Mark. He, he, he ain't get baptized. He, he ain't getting into the water. How, how, how are you going to get there? Because he already recognized if you believe all you need to do is believe. And if you don't get a chance to get to the water, that's okay. Because I know that in my heart, if I believe, thou shall be saved. Who am I talking to in here? And I just want to celebrate. I want to celebrate because we get an opportunity to be a witness of people who will get in the water today. We've got three people today. Come on, let's make some noise. That's going to get their life and be remembered by God. Now, here's the thing. God, he recognizes the gift. The, the, the thief, he says, I'm going to repent. And then after he repents, he says, okay, I've repented, and I want to receive the gift. And when I receive that gift of salvation, and many of you have already received the gift, but here is the message for you. Because you're saying, you're right, Mark. 
I'm a sinner. I need grace to be saved. I'm a sinner. I need God's mercy to come into my life. I'm a sinner. I messed up and Jesus is coming to my life. That's good. But here's where we mess up. We mess up because we have the gift, but we're being selfish with the gift instead of sharing the gift. We have to stop being selfish and start sharing. See, that's the linchpin that's going to hit some of us right in our guts because the question is, why have you been keeping this gift to yourself? Why have you not been sharing the same gospel that the God who created you, the God of the universe, the God who saved my life can save yours too, the God who got me out of addiction can break yours too, the God who got me out of shackles can break your shackles too, the God who got me out of handcuffs can break your handcuffs too. The God who got me out of a bad relationship can get you out too. Who am I talking to in the building? I dare you to look at the person next to you and tell them you got to stop being selfish and share the gift. Because that's what our God does. See, the problem is we've gotten so prideful that we forget the criminal that's on the cross remains nameless because the truth is his name could be any one of ours. So if that's you, if that's you today, we're going to open up this baptismal pool and today is your day to be remembered. By God, you can receive the gift today. All you have to do is say, I believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. The same thing that this thief did on the cross. And if you're making that decision for the first time today, you can go and go to the team in the prayer room to my left, your right. They'll pray with you. You can get changed. You didn't prepare today. I'm sure the thief didn't know he was going to get salvation when he was standing, when he was laying up there on the cross, but it came. And guess what? Jesus had prepared for him, and we prepared for you. We've got a change of clothes. That's not an excuse. You can go home dry. But you've got to be willing to receive the gift that God wants to offer you. So come on, I want you to stand, and I want to pray with you before we continue in worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for reminding us of the gifts for convicts like ourselves. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it's because of your sacrifice on Calvary's cross that we get an opportunity to receive the gift of salvation. And so today, God, I pray that every person under the sound of my voice and attending online, that if they're making a decision, God, that they should know that when that thief made that decision on the cross, that heaven was rejoicing because another, another son has made his way back home. And today, God, maybe there's another daughter, there's another son that wants to say, I too want to receive the gift. I too recognize that you are the Savior of the world. I too want to believe and confess. I too want to repent and allow the Holy Spirit to do an internal shift in my life. I too want it, God. That if they're here today, that they won't be shy on you, but that they would make room for you, God. Help them to make room in their lives so that they can hear from you, so that they can move according to your word, and so that you would bring glory into their life. God, we thank you for the gift. The gifts that you give all of us, for all of us, are really the convict. In Jesus' name.